the ascension of Jesus Christ, the coming of the Holy Ghost. Uh, last week we looked at persecution coming to the church. Now it's interesting. Um, when we look in the scriptures and see persecution, we see it, but we don't see a lot about it. We actually learn more of the persecution of the church reading through history than we do from the scriptures. Um, as the scriptures are focused upon uh, individuals or small pockets of people. Whereas as we look back at history, we can see what the, the, the nation or the government or the society did. And it's, so it's interesting, we read, we read in the scripture, we see persecution, and a lot of times we kind of gloss right over it and don't see all that's taking place. And, you know, I was thinking, even as I was working on a lesson this week, um, we kind of blew right through it. We talked about persecution, and it was uh, basic, basically Peter and John get tossed into jail, threatened, released. And there's a lot more happening that we mentioned that uh, most of the apostles, well, they died of natural causes because their heart stopped. Uh, however, their heart stopped, it had help. Um, and the only one who died of truly natural causes was John, and that's just because he wouldn't die. Um, they tried to kill him multiple times and finally exiled him to Patmos and left him out there to rot. And so, you know, we read and we see what's taking place here, and we, it's one of those where we've got to read and, uh, as Paul Harvey used to say, try to get the rest of the story see all that's there. This week we look at the, the, the spreading of the gospel. Um, the persecuted Christians preach the word wherever they're scattered. They move out of Jerusalem and as they go, their mouth doesn't stop talking. Uh, just a couple notes as we get started here. Um, the, uh, we saw Peter and John last week uh, don't preach this anymore. And they said, well, we have to do what God said. Uh, the leaders, be they religious or political, uh, were not pleased with the outcome because these people went out and they continued to preach. Um, and the more they preached, the more angry the leaders got. And the more angry the leaders got, guess what? <laughs> the more they preached. And uh, so they continued to preach. Today we'll see Philip as he goes out. Um, but the early Christians are suffering, suffering, suffering. They're suffering severe persecution, um, even to the point of death. Uh, one of the notes, and I have it, uh, it might be all the way toward the end in the application questions. Um, in America, we are very used to what we call first world problems. I have no cell service. <laughs> Big deal. <laughs> you know, uh, but isn't that a, that's a, a major problem for us? And you know, two thirds of the world says, so? We don't have cell service either. Uh, you know, think of the things that are a big problem for us. We, we've run into, over the last few months, um, shortages in the store. You go to the store, the shelf is empty of the product that you want, but the com comparable product right next to it is probably overflowing. You know, it's not like we're out of food, we're out of the food that we want. It's not like we're out of, the, we're out of what we want. Whereas much of the world has to do without. And we'll come back and talk about that as we uh, get a little bit deeper into this. Uh, and the question is, how does persecution promote the spread of the gospel? It kind of seems as if they're at odds. You think that persecution would squash the gospel, but it doesn't. And, and so we'll see that as we go today. Uh, our verse, I added a couple you can't see the numbers there. It's just kind of, you can, might see the red dots. It's kind of breaking it up a little bit, different thoughts within the verse. Uh, the first one is you, sh you should receive power. Notice that is the prerequisite for everything else in this verse. Uh, but you're going to get that power after that you receive the Holy Ghost. So you're gonna, uh, they're going to get the Holy Ghost. Remember, Jesus told them, I want you to stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You're going to get the Holy Ghost. As he comes, then you're going to have this great power. But that's going to be for a specific purpose, that you will go out and be witnesses. But then he's, he takes and builds upon that idea of being witnesses. He says, I want you to be witnesses. And then he says, I want you to get out of Jerusalem. Be witnesses in Jerusalem, but also in Judea and in Samaria. Now think about the Jews. Most all, most all of these earliest of the believers were of what nationality? 
Well, they're Jews. And remember the story of the woman at the well. What did the Jews think of the Samaritans? Or remember, he was talking to a Samaritan woman. She, said, she made the comment that we don't have anything to do with you people. Uh, the feeling was mutual. The Jews didn't like them, and they didn't really care for the Jews. And now in the Great Commission, I want you to go into all the world. Here at the Ascension, as it's uh, given more specific instruction, I want you to go even to these people that you don't like. And then he takes and builds on that, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. There was a purpose for this. It was to get the gospel out. If you have your Bibles, go to Acts 8. Acts 8 is where we will get started today. Eight one and Saul was consenting unto his death. If you remember last week, I said this actually should be seven sixty one. It's a continuation of the previous thought. Stephen is being stoned by the religious leaders. He kneels down. He cries out to God, "Lay not this sin upon uh, to their account." Saul is consenting unto his death. Then we have the new thought starting up. But Saul is a big player here, so we'll take it. And at that time, there was a great persecution. Not that there was a persecution. Notice the words that Luke is using here. There was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Hey, there's a couple of those locations that we just saw back in... Let me get there. Hey, hey, Jerusalem, that's where they were. Judea... They're moving there, and Samaria. All that's left is the uttermost part of the earth. I mean, they are being forced out of Jerusalem by the persecution. Um, everybody leaves, not everybody, but you understand. Uh, they're being scattered, but the apostles stay. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. A couple of things that I find interesting here. Um, let's just run through the notes and then I'll add, add another thought or two. Uh, so we have the passage looking back to the death of Stephen and then tying it together with the persecution. And this persecution is not simply, hey, we're being discomforted. Uh, this is a great persecution. Um, and it caused the church to scatter, to move, to relocate. Um, they have to get out of their comfort zone. Not that life was easy for them, but if it hadn't been for the persecution, would they have left Jerusalem? Well, yeah. uh, our, our phrase that we use, they're feeling fat and happy. Uh, they're able to go out and preach. Oh, they're being beaten and released. But they're paying the price for ministering. But they're staying in Jerusalem. And then the Persecution increases in intensity. It's a great persecution, and it causes the church to scatter. Um, and Saul, he made havoc of the church. He is hauling them into prison. What is our word here? Hailing them. Hailing men and women uh, committed them to prison. So he's, he's just, he's on a mission. And he believes that he's on a mission from God even as he is fighting against the very church of God. Um, obviously, he's misguided at this point. But the persecution causes the church to scatter. And Paul, we saw in chapter 7, he was present. He was agreeing to the death. We saw that in 8.1. That he was, in, back in verse, uh, chapter 7, he was overseeing the cloaks. And now he goes from being in agreement to taking leadership of, you know what, we're going to put an end to this right now. And it's not just that he, that he attacked. Again, I find interesting that the terminology that's used here. He's wreaking havoc on the church. <clears throat> he is going door to door, really trying to stop this church from moving forward. And we have here that it's Saul. Uh, again, he's in a leadership position. Um, we don't know a whole lot about this. 
We don't know if the Sanhedrin said, hey, we need you to take this on. Or we don't know if Saul said, you know what, I am going to take this. We don't know where the thought originated, but it, Saul is the one that everybody knows him. Remember, we'll shoot forward a little bit. Remember when uh, he has his conversion and he's in the city and the people are like, wait a minute, this is the same one that was attacking, tormenting, persecuting the church. They know him. And we've mentioned numerous times, there was no 24-hour news cycle. There was no video. It wasn't like they went to the post office and there was a picture of Saul on the wall saying, watch out for this guy. But word traveled. They knew him. And yet, as we mentioned here, uh, he's traveling throughout the region. He's now staying in Jerusalem. When we see his conversion coming up here in chapter 9, he's on his way to Damascus. So he's traveling the region. He's tormenting the church wherever the church goes. Well, that's his plan. God kind of stops him in his tracks. But that's his plan. He's going to torment the church. But as the church is traveling, not everybody's leaving Jerusalem. And we mentioned that the apostles stay, uh, some others stay, but large numbers are traveling around. Uh, and many of these went to Judea, the region around, and Samaria, which is up to the north of Jerusalem. They're traveling to the places that Christ had told them, I want you to go and be witnesses of me. What are they trying to do? They're trying to get away from the persecution. So what are they doing? They're doing what God told them to do, even though they have a little bit different impetus in going. They've got different incentive. They don't want to die. But the end result is the same. They're moving forward and they're sharing the gospel. Not everybody leaves. The apostles we mentioned, they stay. There are a few others that do. Now, those who go take the gospel message with them. They're preaching as they go. Uh, and the word is preached everywhere they go. Uh, Again, we alluded already to chapter 9 as uh, Paul, Saul, is headed to Damascus. Why is he going to Damascus? To get the church. Well, how did the church get there? Well, the believers were first out of Jerusalem. And so we see the church is growing wherever these people go. Uh, and then look at verse 5. Uh, look, verse 4, uh, they were scattered abroad and went, uh, and went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Now, keep in mind, uh, we're, look, we're dealing with geography and topography. Uh, when we think of he went down in our mind, just because we always see maps looking one direction, uh, in our mind when he went down, he went what direction? South. But he went north. Jerusalem's on a mountain. So he went down the mountain. If you, if you have a Bible atlas there in the back, or if you have a map on this page, see where Jerusalem is. When you look up, you find Samaria. So he's going down the mountain, even though he's going up the map. Um, so he goes to Samaria. And we have Philip introduced here. We won't see a lot of Philip, but we will see him again, even in the lesson today. Um, so it's kind of our introduction to Philip. Just a, a couple brief uh, sentences here. Went down to the city of Samaria, preached Christ unto them. Fulfilling the command of Christ. We don't see any hesitation. We don't see any kind of disobedience. I do see irony. Again, the Jews and the Samaritans did not, always, did not ever get along. He goes and preaches. Look at verse 6. I find verse 6 really interesting. Um, verse 6, uh, the Samaritans listened. They listened with one accord. It's like they sat down and they wanted to hear what this guy had to say. Now, how much was there still the result of the woman at the well taking place within the city? We don't have any idea. That had been a couple of years earlier. Not a lot. Remember our timeline. Jesus, his actual ministry period was about three and a half years. He's crucified. He's raised again. 
from, the, from that point until the coming of the Holy Ghost was what, 50 days, I think we saw? Pentecost. And then we have shortly thereafter the scattering. So this, there was not a long window of time here. So is it possible that some of these, we have heard this message before, but not in its fullness? Now the Jews, in this case Philip, they're coming and they're talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came, was crucified. Perhaps the Samaritans had heard of that. He was raised again. They probably had not heard that. The Jews are coming and preaching and the Samaritans are enthralled. They're paying heed with one accord. Um, they listen to the things that Philip speaks and they see the miracles which he did. Let's uh, bust through a couple of the notes here. He's mentioned uh, on down the road here, chapter 20, he's called Philip the evangelist. What does he do? He's one that goes about and as he's going, he's preaching and teaching. He's sharing the gospel wherever he goes. He goes to Samaria and he goes there and he's going to proclaim the gospel to the people that are there. Again, I find that intriguing. Many hear the message. And as he's there, he's working miracles. Keep in mind, there's one thing that you have with you today that he did not have available to him. The completed scriptures. At this point, the miracles were still there to validate the message. Paul talks about that in his letter to, to the church at Corinth. And so he's working miracles, and the miracles are a sign that he has God's blessing upon him, that he is preaching the word of God. And the Samaritans listen. They listen to people they instinctively don't like. And I, again, I find that interesting. Because the message of Jesus Christ transcends cultures, transcends boundaries. It transcends races. The message of Jesus Christ is for all men in every place. And here's Philip obeying the command of Christ and going to, to spread the gospel. And let me get my page moved over here. I, I love the next verse there, uh, verse 8. And there was great joy in the city. When I read that, my mind all, almost each time I see that goes back to Jonah in the city of Nineveh. Jonah comes in to people he doesn't like. He preaches to them, repent, or God's going to wipe you out. And the people go to sackcloth and ashes and repent. And it doesn't say that it was one or two. It was the entire city. Don't know that it was each and every living, breathing soul, but it was the vast majority of the people. We find that same thing here. Where the message is preached and the vast majority of the people hear what percentage believe? Couldn't tell you. But it does say that the city was filled with great joy. They have their heart impacted. Uh, let's see, learn through his notes. A um, couple notes here that uh, enters in Genesis tucked in here that I thought were kind of interesting. Uh, verse 4, they, uh, they say that, uh, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And they're saying, you know what, verse 5 probably is like a specific example of verse 4. Verse 4 makes the general statement. Verse 5 shows us what's happening. Um, the apostles then hear what's taking place. Um, and we, uh, let's, hear, let's see here, uh, drop down. Uh, we've got Simon in verse 9. Um, look at verse, verse 12. But uh, when they believed, Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of uh, Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And Simon believes. I'm going to drop down here. I look at verse 14. Now when the apostles were, which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Uh, remember, Peter and John, we've already seen together as a duel here, uh, taken, beaten, and imprisoned. Um, here they are again. The apostles hear what's happening in Samaria, and so they send two of their own up to Samaria. Uh, verse 15, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Again, interesting. They didn't, by nature, they've always grown up. Those people are evil. And now they come to them. They see what's happening. 
and they pray that they would receive the Holy Ghost just like they had received the Holy Ghost. Um, uh, let's see here. And look at verse 25. And when they, uh, Peter and John, had testified and preached the word, they returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in the many villages of the Samaritans. So even after they got done in Samaria, the big city, they were done with their work there. They headed back to Jerusalem. And as they go, they preach in the villages of the Samaritans on their way back to Jerusalem. You know what? We've got a message. What's the song that we have? I have a message to tell to the nations. They had a message for the people, regardless of who those people were. And it's interesting to see as we read all this taking place. A couple notes, I've already alluded to it. Uh, the Jews did not think highly of the Samaritans. The feeling was mutual. And yet the love of God is displayed to us and then needs to be displayed through us. They had experienced the saving grace of Jesus Christ and they understood that they needed to share that gospel of, of Jesus Christ to the people around them. Wherever those people were, whoever those people were. Uh, it may not be easy. It may be that as they went to the city, they had to swallow hard and say, I don't understand, but this is what God's told us. Or they may have said, you know what? God's work is going forward. We don't know. We do know that uh, biases that we've grown up with are sometimes hard to overcome, aren't they? And again, they did not like the Samaritans. But the gospel went out to the Samaritans just as well. Um, staying within uh, this as we've uh, moved now from Philip and Samaria and Peter and John going up to Samaria. Now we come to the Ethiopian. Uh, look at verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip. Uh, Philip, we know him as the evangelist, scattered, moved out of Jerusalem, went to Samaria. Now the angel of the Lord says, your work here is done. Arise, go toward the south under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, or Gaza, which is desert. So, and I didn't put the map up. Uh, didn't think about it then. I think about it now. Should have. Uh, but he's going uh, from Samaria, which is up north, go south, past Jerusalem, keep going down to uh, Gaza. Uh, we're familiar with this in politics and stuff today, the Gaza Strip. We hear about that, uh, heard about it more in a couple decades past, but um, I want you to head down that way and preach. And it's desert area. Uh, and he arose and went. So the angel of the Lord instructs Philip, it, it's time to move on. I want you to head toward Gaza, south of Jerusalem now. And this region is the desert, uh, dry, uh, no convenience stores where you can buy a large soft drink. Uh, can't get a bottle of water. Uh, and it's kind of like a statement just kind of tossed in there, but think about it. Also, probably not a lot of travelers are big cities there. Uh, in that age, the big cities were usually somewhere near a river. You needed water. And so it isn't kind of like desert. And Philip, he'd be, what does he do? Um... He arose and went. He obeyed. He did what he was told. And so he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. So he, he arises, he gets up, he goes and does what he's told, and he just happens to encounter this Ethiopian. Now think for a second. I want you to go preach in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Philip is about to preach to the uttermost part of the earth without going to the uttermost part of the earth. Philip is about to get the gospel to the African continent before he ever gets to the African continent. Simply by doing what God told him, when God told him, and talking to who God told him. And this Ethiopian, it tells us here, uh, he is a man of prestige. Uh, he is a man who has position. Uh, he's the, he's in charge of all the treasure. Probably not looking to figure out where his next meal is going to come from. 
Um, in our world today, in our country today, that would be similar to being Secretary of the Treasury. He's the guy in charge of the monies, of the currency, of the treasure. Uh, we won't take a lot of time with this. Uh, the, the idea of, of the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, one of two ideas. Either he had been emasculated and was not able to have kids, then he gets this position because he's not going to raise up his own kids and try to overthrow the queen. Sometimes, occasionally, it's a term used for specific government officials. In either case, he, he may be, meet one or both criteria. Don't know. We know that we see him here. He's called the Ethiopian eunuch. It's interesting. Look at the very end of verse 27. Had come to Jerusalem to worship. What did he know of God prior to running into Philip? Had he heard any of the gospel message to this point? I mean, these are questions that we don't have answers to, but they're legitimate questions. We don't know what he knew of Jesus Christ, but we do know that he knew of the God of the Jews. It's interesting. He goes to Jerusalem to worship. Would appear, now think back. Let's go way back to, let's see, we had King Saul, King David, and then who was the third king? King Solomon. And he had a, a special visitor from the south. Uh, some queen that came to test his wisdom because she was astounded by what she'd heard and she wanted to see if it was true. It may very well be now that the Ethiopians, they're aware of this God and have been for some time. He goes to worship. He went with a right motive, and God, in his grace, takes him far beyond what that Ethiopian had ever imagined. Um, the Spirit then, uh, excuse me, on his way back to Ethiopia, he's reading Isaiah. Now, a couple things that are interesting. He went to worship, and obviously he wasn't We go to church, as soon as church is done, it's okay, what's to eat? And kind of lose sight of all that took place. He went to church, and on his way back, church is still working in his heart. He wants to know more. And it's ironic, of all the Old Testament passages that look forward to Jesus Christ, Isaiah 53 may be the most clear and prophetic, looking forward to the Death of the Lamb of God. And he just, ha okay, we got here, um, uh, that might be in the next slide. Um, that Philip just, ha no, it's on the last slide. Philip just happens to run into this eunuch. The eunuch just happens to be reading, reading from Isaiah 53. <laughs> just happens to be. And the Spirit directs Philip to, Okay, directed him to Samaria, says it's time to move on, says go to Gaza. His purpose in going to Gaza is not to go to the region, although that's where he's going. Now the Spirit directs him to a specific chariot. And Philip hears, and that, that causes me to have questions as well. Lots of things cause me to have questions. Um, okay, let's have a race. Man versus horse and chariot. Who's going to win? The horse and chariot was not trying to break a record here. You've got a long trip ahead of you and you're going through the desert. But still, the spirit brings him to intersect with this chariot, this specific chariot. Look at verse 29. The spirit says unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understandest thou what thou readest? Do you understand this? And the Ethiopian's like, well, uh, no. And this question is, is the prophet speaking of himself or of somebody else? Great question. And Philip couldn't have asked for a bigger, wider open door. 
Because Philip then uh, proceeds to present unto him the one that the prophet was talking about. Uh, Philip uses the passage to introduce Jesus Christ. And we've mentioned before, you've heard this before in other settings, but the entirety of the Bible points to Jesus Christ. Some of it, it through narrative, some of it through prophecy. The book of Isaiah, specifically Isaiah 53, a very clear picture, prophetic picture, of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And so Philip hears the Ethiopian reading. Do you understand what you're reading? Not really. Who's he talking about? Well, let me tell you. And Philip steps right in. The Ethiopian then hears what Philip has to say, believes what Philip has to say, and is baptized. And it's, it's his statement. You know, um, and we have it here. Um, Verse 36, and as they went their way, they came unto certain water, and the Ethiopian said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? The Ethiopian takes the lead on this and says, here's water. Why not? Is there anything stopping me? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, look at the statement here, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I say, wow. Wow. Philip brought by divine appointment from Samaria to Gaza to a specific chariot, hears him reading a passage. Reading a, if he hears him reading, that means he's reading it out loud without getting chariot sick, trying to read as he's writing. And do you understand? And the Ethiopian doesn't say, well, yes, of course I understand. I mean, how are you feeling today? Oh, I feel fine. You might feel completely miserable, but what do, we, what do we say most of the time? I'm okay. I'm fine. F Philip does not, or the Ethiopian does not say, yeah, I, I understand it. He says, no, who's he talking about? And Philip steps right up and says, let me tell you who. And he preaches, and you notice, we don't know how long the message is, but we've got the high points here. Um, it starts out, and uh, he comes up and sits with the Ethiopian, and Philip opened his mouth and began to, at the same scripture, and preached unto him Jesus. Uh, that, that, was, that was the key point. That, that was the focus. And the Ethiopian hears, believes, sees water, says, I need to be baptized. Had Philip even talked about that topic? Don't know. It doesn't tell us. But he knew that there was another step that needed to take place. So the Philip, uh, Philip baptizes the Ethiopian. They come up out of the water. The Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. The Ethiopian saw him no more. And he, Ethiopian, went his way rejoicing. What did we see? What was our last statement in Samaria? The city was filled with great joy. The gospel changes hearts and changes perspective. We see that great joy mentioned again. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Um, so after the baptism, Philip is taken away by the Spirit, and um, he's next seen about 20 miles away. Now, he's seen at Azotus. I see that name in here, and I'm like, okay, good, just one more name I don't know. And then as I'm reading in the notes for the, well, that's Ashkelon. Wait a minute, I do know Ashkelon. Remember back to uh, uh, Goliath? Where was Goliath from? Gaza, and Gath, and Ashkelon. We had the five cities of the Philistines. Here's two of them mentioned right here. And so I find it, the gospel is going to... Jerusalem is already there. Judea, as they're forced out. And Samaria, and now the uttermost part of the earth. And even further than they had gone yet, as the Ethiopian continues on home. Wait a minute. So it went to Samaria. Jews don't like the Samaritans. Samaritans, excuse me. Goes to the cities of the Philistines. 
who, again, time has passed, but the Jews don't get along well with those people down there. We mentioned already, the gospel doesn't stop with people that look and, look and act and talk just like me. The gospel goes around the world. And so the Ethiopian rejoices on the way home. And then I've got, again, if you remember when we started, I said, we see the persecution best as we study history. We're not sure about all the details, but the church grows strong in Ethiopia. If you go back and study church history, when you get out of the early church, and then you get out of the Middle East, you know where we see the strongest record of the church? In the, the, the nation, the, the region of Ethiopia. How much of that had to do with this guy? I don't know. But I would think that some of it did as he went back and he told others what he had heard. He went back and he told others why he had great joy. It's interesting to see the gospel of Jesus Christ changes lives. So application questions. Eh, six minutes, we might get through some of these. Um, think about the world today. Where do we see the gospel spreading as a result of persecution or by faithful witness of proclaiming it to others? Um, and I've, I've just got a couple notes here for each of these, really. Um, persecution tends to grow the church. If we go all the way back to the title slide, the gospel is spread by Christians fleeing persecution. Persecution, by and large, tends to grow the church, not squash the church. Um, and I mentioned also earlier, uh, first world problems versus persecution. I'll, I'll toss a couple out here. Um, I can see on the horizon the day coming when church giving is not tax deductible. And at that point, I can hear Christians yelling about being persecuted. And let me introduce you to Fox's Book of Martyrs. <laughs> uh, I can see the day coming when churches are no longer tax exempt. I mean, just stop and think about where we are and how secular our country is now. I mean, if you're honest, you can see that day coming and it may not be very far away. Every new bill Congress signed or Congress passes and the president signs wants more money that we don't have. Think about all the money that the churches, church, generic term, churches across the country have that the government can't get its fingers on. Can you see the day when the government says, I want to get my fingers on that money? Is that true biblical persecution? I'm hoping those days don't come. To be honest, I would like to see the church still in a place of respect and seeing as something that makes a difference that we've got to support. But I can see that day coming. That's not persecution. There's real persecution taking place in the world today. Um, we have countries where our missionaries say, don't post our letters, don't put our name in the bulletin. Why? Because they're afraid of real, genuine persecution. Uh, not having their giving tax deductible is not something that ever crosses their mind. And so persecution may very well be coming here. But we need to understand there's a big difference between first world problems and persecution. Um, how about China? The underground, under, why is it an underground church? Because of persecution. And yet the underground church is thriving in China. Because persecution tends to grow the church. Why? Because those people that they're committed. Uh, many people today believe that the gospel cannot be preached unless you build relationships. Now, is there a problem with building relationships? No. Building relationships is good. But do you have to build a relationship in order to preach the gospel? Well, look at the second part of the question here. Uh, how do these accounts of Philip show that that idea to be false? Um, relationship building is good, but it cannot replace the proclamation of the gospel. We could spend four and a half years building a relationship and never say a word about Jesus Christ. We've got to blend the two. The building, the relationship building and telling. Um, 
Philip, when he found an open door, he walked right through it. Now, what we don't see, we don't see Philip kicking the door open. He goes to the chariot and he hears the Ethiopian reading. And what's his question? His question is not, are you going to heaven or hell? His question is, do you understand what you're reading? He sees an open door and he goes through that door. And he goes through that door, shall we say, tactfully. He could have very easy, he could have alienated the Ethiopian right there and did not. We see that even in, in Samaria. You bunch of filthy dogs, God's gospel's not coming to you. No, what does he do? He goes in, he preaches, they hear, they believe. I mean, you see the, the progression here? He, go, he sees an open door, he goes through it. Um, how have you seen the, the work of God? How have you seen God at work in you uh, in order to spread the gospel? What opportunities have you had to tell others about Jesus Christ? Uh, first of all, we need to be intentional as we interact with people. Uh, I say, as we're, excuse the mistake there. But we need to be intentional. Philip was going to Gaza for one purpose. He just didn't know who he was going, who he was going to run into. Um, and we may not see great results. We can go back in the history, the history of missions. Some of the earliest of missionaries worked for years with one or two converts. What would the modern, of, modern American church have done? Told them to go to a different field or we're going to pull your support. Now, they, you need to go to a field that wants to listen, but sometimes if they've never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, you've got to take time to cultivate that field. And so we may not see results early, but the faithfulness is necessary so that people can hear and understand, and when they understand, that they can believe. Um, how, how well do you identify with Philip? Are you ready and willing to go where the gospel needs to be proclaimed? Are you ready to go? Well, let me think about that for a second. I don't want to leave Jerusalem yet. And God says, here, let me help. If God, one of the characteristics of God, the qualities, the attributes of God that we've talked about numerous times is his sovereignty. If God is in charge, he is in charge of what? It's either everything or nothing. If he, because if he's not in charge of everything, he's not God. So if God is in charge of everything, could he have stopped that persecution? Sure. God didn't stop it. God used it. God used it to grow the church. To grow the church beyond the walls of Jerusalem. Well, wait a minute. How did you hear the gospel? You heard the gospel because somebody back in the first century obeyed. And somebody in the second century obeyed. In the third century obeyed. Do I need to get to the 20th and 21st century? I mean, we heard the gospel because people before us obeyed. They went out and took the gospel to the people around them. And this um, might be the last one here. As we understand more about how God providentially worked in history, how should we respond to that? Um, how do we respond to the gospel? As we see the providences, the works of God, we should be more moved to worship. As we see God at work, that should cause us to rejoice within our heart. And as we're moved to worship, we should have a greater desire to tell others. As we see what God has done, we should, with grateful hearts, praise Him. The more that we praise Him, we should want others to know that they also need to know who God is and what God has done. And so, there's a lot happening here. It's a fantastic, fantastic story as we see the work of God go on in spite of persecution, or shall we say because of persecution. When persecution comes, we don't have to just say, okay, hit me again. But we can also understand that just like the, the well, when Peter and John, we, we met, read it last week and kind of moved on, that wasn't the focus last week. Peter and John, after they were imprisoned, and they were sent out, they went back and they rejoiced that they had had opportunity to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. That doesn't make sense. We rejoice because we had the opportunity. Yeah. Because the only reason we would suffer is because we're, ha we're making a difference, we're having an impact. If we weren't making an impact, why would the lost world even care? They do care 
because the gospel of Jesus Christ will not return void. It goes out, it makes a difference. Father, we thank you for uh, your word. Thank you for your works. And God, as we see you work, as we read your word, God, help it to cause us to rejoice. Help it to cause us to have a greater desire to share the gospel with those around us. Father, I pray that you would just grow the ministry, grow the outreach of this church, the people who make up this church. Father, I ask you to be with the service to come, that you be with uh, hearts, help us to have hearts and minds that are open and attentive to what you have for us. God, be with the pastor. I pray that you would give him the words that we need to hear. Accomplish your will and your purpose in us and through us, we ask in your name, amen. Have a great